posted something. Oh yeah, did you? I didn't see what you posted. Yeah. The secret project. You gotta hype it up early and just give little pieces here and there. Heck yeah. I'm just hoping it goes as well as we want it to. But again, I didn't do this for attention. I did it just because I like doing it. Yeah, and I just feel like I I really need a creative outlet because I just think writing. Um, writing reviews is just not sustainable for me anymore. I went in the entirety of 2018 without posting a single review on my blog. Yeah, I don't think I've done one in a long time. And I was so hyped because I was like, okay, this is a schedule and I'm going to have a specific photo I use for reviews. And like, no, that didn't make a difference. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I like the photo I use, like the setup, but you know what? <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, I totally fell off on, on. I was doing pretty good on Goodreads, but then I fell off terribly yeah i track on goodreads but I, and i but i rarely write reviews on it anymore yeah same. Here. i have to be like really hyped about a book or i'll be like hey if you like this you'll like this yeah well should we get this thing rolling yeah all right so i'm sure i included it in the title and description of whatnot but what we're going to be doing today is ash came up with the idea of the five books that define you as a person and doesn't necessarily have to be favorites or anything, but just the books that tell people kind of who you are, right? Yep. All right. Uh, or it's wanna... that, you know, people would understand you or something about you if they read this book. Okay. That makes sense. And it was much harder than I thought because I automatically just went to my like top five favorite books and I was like, well, it's my favorite book just because I love the story, but it doesn't really have a personal significance other than that. Right. Yeah, that was a lot harder than I thought it was. And then, like, of course, your some of your favorites do sneak onto there because obviously, like, something that's your all-time favorite book, like, that does define you, that does shape you. So I think that's why I think the one we all have in common is on there. Yeah, I, I think that's <laughs> that's I I put my all-time favorite book as an honorable mention because I feel like it was kind of a cop out to just throw that on there and be like, it's my favorite book, that's why, and that's that's all. <laughs> Um, Fair enough. Do you do you want to kick it off, or do you want me to kick it off? Um, you're the host. You do first. All right, I'll go first. So, my first book that I chose is um, "I Am Legend," and I chose that because it does have a sort of a personal significance for me. Um, I've always been a huge. This is going to kind of detour a little bit, but I've always been a huge Will Smith fan. And when I saw that the movie was coming out, I was God, how old was I? Hmm. 18 or something like that when that came out so um i was all excited for it my grandma told me you know that was a book from the 50s right and i said no and she goes well i'm gonna buy you the book you read it and then go see the movie and tell me what you think of both so i said okay and the book she bought me was like close to 400 pages but if you've read i am legend you know it's only like 180 pages so that kind of threw me off a little bit but that is the one that sort of kicked off um my love of like reading horror and actually getting back into reading it it'll be a few more years before i actually heavily got back into reading but that one just for the personal memory of it and that did that was my favorite book that i had read all the way up until my current favorite book which we'll get to in the end but yeah so my number one would be i am legend just for personal significance and what really got me back into reading it's funny that you say that because i've never really stopped being a reader but a friend of mine had like all richard matheson and i was like oh i'll borrow these and start reading them and that's what got me to realize like oh maybe i'm not a scaredy cat i was (laughs) before (laughs) and so i i've read almost everything he's ever written at least it's been made in book form so i get what you're saying though he just i think a lot of times when we we we're exposure to horror things when we're younger is like horror movies which yeah. are so different than horror books. Oh, God, and so yeah. I think like reading Matheson was the first time I was like, oh, this is what like adult horror is or like mm-hmm. a grown up version of it because so much of his horror is not like, yes, there's the monster or the thing, but like I Am Legend is so much more about isolation and loneliness, you know? And so I think it's it's where you realize like horror is the normal emotions you feel just like extremely um, like bigger there's a bigger version of things we feel all the time yeah and i'm actually surprised i i liked as much as i did at the time because um i went and saw 
Pulp Fiction as a kid in the theater. I was like five years old, but even then I was enthralled in just good dialogue. And Mm -hmm. that book up until the three quarter mark has almost no dialogue (laughs) because there's only one character. So that was just, that was really a shock to me, but it was just so enthralling. You know, you didn't care. You were just on this journey with, with him. Yes. Yes. I would definitely agree with that. All right. What's your number? Well, what's your first pick? <clears throat> okay. So my first pick and why this is a lot about me is this, it's the first book in a trilogy. Uh, it's called Uglies by Scott Westerfeld. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because when I, when reading started to change for me, I started reading YA and I was, it was right when like sort of YA was going through its renaissance when it was rebranding itself of what it was. And that book just, I had to read it for a class in college. Um, we had to like find something. It was how to teach like middle grade and like to middle school students. Mm -hmm. And I found that book and I just got super obsessed with it. And I read all three of them in like a week. And actually that was the first time I made friends on the internet um, was because of this book, but it just, it's, it shows like how I really like my badass female heroines and I like (laughs) them to be flawed and complicated. And because the, the main character Tally and actually uh, Tally was, uh, in the running to be my daughter's name is mm. between that and her actual name, Veronica. Like that's how much that series means to me is like, I wanted to name my daughter after the main character. Um, I can see that because now like, like I'm like, is it my all time favorite book? Do I like, no, but it's just one of those things where like in that moment, it shaped me so much and it got me like obsessively reading again. And Scott Westerfeld and his wife are super connected to a lot of other people in, in just YA and literature in general. And uh, it got me reading so many other people because he would post about them and talk about them. And so it just opened up. It reminded me, like, I can find a lot of good books on the Internet now. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. But I actually joined a um, there was a bunch of us that made a forum, like an Internet forum. And we're on it for like two years straight. And like, I'm still friends with some of them, like in our (laughs) lives outside of the forum, even though we don't go on there anymore, because that we it didn't always be about books. We ended up just talking about life. And they became my friends, and it was pretty awesome. See, it's kind of like how this happened. Right? Exactly. <laughs> although, we are talk- although we are talking about books, but still. Yeah. But that's like, book. when you find other book people, like, it's it's a gift. It's a gift. And I think sometimes you don't always find those people, you know, in your in your life that you interact with, like, physically. But Instagram has been great for that. Yeah, definitely. I think I know, in my personal life, two people that I can talk to about books although we don't necessarily read the same books although i did get um one of my girlfriend's friends hooked on the miriam black series and now she's like flying through them oh they're so good though (laughs) they are really good that's a good there's the right kind of person to recommend that series too oh yeah definitely all right what's your next one all right so my number two again is for um this this is actually so the first book i read several years later after i am legend that kicked off me being a reader up until now um i used to subscribe to loot crate and there was a uh, i can't remember the theme of it but it was video game themed and the it came with a book which to me is a little weird to send to people who love gaming because typically i think people who game don't read but maybe that's just a stereotype that i shouldn't enforce (laughs) i don't know i would i would think the same thing so (laughs) yeah um (laughs) But it came with uh, Ready Player One by Ernest Klein. Yeah. And just, it was everything I loved. It was about video games. It was about pop culture and all the nostalgia and all that kind of stuff. And um, I really love just all the callbacks to different pop culture things, which is also why I love the British sitcom Spaced. (laughs) Because that's just nothing but callbacks to american pop culture and and then you know the fantasy aspect of it was just so much fun i've never i don't think i'd ever read a i wouldn't even call it a high fantasy but just you know a very fantastical book set in dystopian future and everyone's plugged into the internet to get away from real life which i feel like we're almost heading that way already pretty much i really do like to that it was a dystopia but it felt different because i feel like we're so saturated with that right now yeah. i remember reading it and feeling like oh this is a little less hopeful like i feel like a lot of dystopia is like we're gonna save the world and ready player one was like no we're gonna save this other world that's part of our world yeah i just like that world. distinction yeah yeah and unfortunately his 
second book, which I was really excited for, was a huge letdown to me. I have heard that. That's why I haven't read it. (laughs) I mean, it was fine, but there was, it was nothing special whatsoever to me anyway. I'm sure a lot of people love it. So, but yeah, just because that encompassed everything that I loved, the fantastical nature of the pop culture, video games, movies, music, just everything all in one. And that really got me thinking like, oh, maybe there's other things I should read. And I, and this isn't on my list, but honestly, I think the next book I read after that was The Shining. Nice. Kind of a kind of a stark contrast, but you know, hey, still in the realm of horror and uh, slight fantasy, not as much, obviously, but. Well, I also think when you come to like the pop culture piece, like The Shining is iconic, both oh, the book yeah. and the movie. Like it's, it's the thing where if someone doesn't really know Stephen King at all, you can be like, oh, The Shining. And usually if they've only seen the movie, you then start telling them all the things that are different in the book. But I feel like that actually is a totally natural transition to me because if you'd never read it before and then you read something like Ready Player One, you're gonna be like, oh, yeah, like this is something that I, you know, I hear about this all the time. Why haven't I read this yet? Yeah. So that transition makes total sense. Yeah. And just I know I wanted to. uh, Well, because back after I had read um, I Am Legend, I was still kind of on a horror kick. And my um, one of my grandmas that I lived with at the time, she would buy a book, read it and then go donate it to the Goodwill or something. So I was just kind of looking at her books and I saw a Stephen King book there. And I told her like I read what it was about and it wound up not being one of his best books, but I still had fun with it. And it was Cell. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and you know that was kind of like the resurgence of the zombie thing so i was like oh i know stephen king never wrote a book by him but stephen king doing zombies like let's do this and then i read that and didn't read anything for a few years <laughs> that makes sense yeah it's not terrible but it's also not good <laughs> one of those ones that you like you have to read you feel like you should yeah it's it's if you're fun, gonna get but... through all of his books it's one that you have to yeah it's a fast food book it's fun but it's n- not nourishing whatsoever I've never heard that before. That's a good one. (laughs) All right. What's your number two? Okay. Number two. This is definitely going to digress a little bit because there's so much context that makes this awesome for me, but it's Dune. All right. Let's do it. Dune. Okay. All right. Because, okay. So when I was like 14, my parents left me home alone for the first time, like where they were going to be gone for multiple days and I got to stay home. And that was also when the Children of Dune miniseries was on, which like young, hot James McAvoy (laughs) <laughs> which was totally why I watched it. I was like, oh, that guy's cute. So I ended up watching it and I got obsessed with it. And then I realized this is a book series. And so I like, immediately begged my parents to buy me Dune. And I read it, which it's dense. And I have this little fat little paperback that was my first copy of it. And I was just obsessed with it. Like I had never, I don't think at that point I'd been exposed to anything that had created such a fully formed universe. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's like there's political systems and economics and everything that's in there and plus all the the messages about the environment and especially when it was written that is very shocking um and like how we care for the environment and transform it and how we take care of people like there's just such high concepts in dune while also having this completely amazing story that you just get completely sucked in by and you have like really strong feelings about the characters and so i just as soon as I finished Dune, I immediately that Christmas got the rest of the books. I I ended up getting only the ones that actually Frank Herbert had written. Mm. And I read the whole series. And I just feel like if, if someone wants to understand how I feel politically, um, a lot of like my my ethical values come from Dune. Like there are so many things that I the way I approach the world now, I can like because I think I read it with a read along last summer and I was like, oh, of course, like all of these things had sunk into my person. Like if you want to know how I think we should approach the world, like that is what you read. Yeah, I, I've i never read it, but there's a, you know, read along coming up. Are you going to do it? I am going to do it. So, all right. Uh, so you've read, well, you've read everything that he wrote, right? Yes, because I think um, there's actually like seven, seven books in the original, like Atreides line, but I think he only wrote the first four maybe five are they as good or better than the first because i've heard they go in a very weird direction oh they totally do except i kind of love it but okay. that's because um there's more than one leto but the paul's son leto is my favorite character mm-hmm. like i just think he's awesome and so i i follow him down some pretty weird rabbit holes in the later books that's for sure oh okay 
So I will I will say they do go in a weird direction, but I think that's also kind of nice because it doesn't go like you expect. I think a lot of times when we look at, you know, sci-fi, you know, trilogies or sagas, we think we know where it's going and you definitely cannot say that about Dune. Oh, that's good. That's kind of what happens with the Dark Tower series. You know, everyone tells you the first four are kind of their own thing and then the last three are their own thing, which I didn't like the tone shift at first but once i finished them you're like it's kind of the same thing it's like you know what it's one of those you thought you knew where it was going but you definitely did not yeah that's why i'm starting book five next month and i'm a little nervous <laughs> again it's i knew it was going to be a tone shift but about a quarter of the way through that i was like you know what this is still it's still dark tower it's still a lot of fun like just roll with it you know yeah i'm excited yes that and i had to ex- i don't know why i excluded the dark tower from my list because I wasn't sure if we could do a series or not, but I mean, if you know me, then you know I love the Dark Tower series. <laughs> yeah. I have a tattoo from the Dark Tower series, but that to me seemed like a cop out just for that reason. But is it, you know, I'm enjoying it so far. I'm excited to get through it this year. Yes, and I'm excited to hear what you think of it when you finish it. Everybody keeps telling me that. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, well, as a perfect transition of sorts. Um, yes, book three. Book three for me is a Stephen King book, and it's It. And well, I, my next book was also going to be It, so oh, shit. you go first. <laughs> All right, then let's just gush about it. Um, I, I mean, I remember seeing the miniseries when it first aired, and dear God, I was four, maybe, and don't know who decided to let me watch it with them as it was airing, but I do remember liking it, but also being terrified of clowns for the next 15 years <laughs> i was just gonna ask that yeah that definitely didn't help with that whatsoever uh it also made me afraid of my own shower drain too that is a completely reasonable feeling that scene in the showers with eddie being in there and then he comes through yeah like i remember i would remember <laughs> taking a shower at like five years old and just staring at that drain the entire time i think that's reasonable given your yeah. exposure yeah and so then, so many years later, once I got into reading again, um, and then them talking about doing the new movie, I honestly don't remember if I read it. I think I did read it before the movie came out. I think that's what got me excited to read it. And by then, um, the size didn't uh, terrify me at all because I had already been reading some fairly thick books by then. And I think I spent a good... I think I spent a good month reading it um, as much as I wanted to speed through it. It's just one of those ones that you want to take it piece by piece to savor and enjoy it because it's just, it's just so good. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's definitely what started me on my reading more epic books, even though I haven't really, I've only done maybe a handful since then, like very thick books. There's a lot of, there's a lot more. um, Oh gosh, I completely forgot the word. Or you need to keep your energy up. What am I talking about? Not sustain. Um, oh my God. Endurance. Yeah, you there need you endurance to read a long book. Like it sounds dumb, but like your brain gets tired too. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. You know, so to really stay in a big fat book in the story, like that's work. Yeah. I think uh, I've actually read it twice and listened to the audiobook once, which the audiobook is actually really good. Stephen Weber does a great job. Okay. I'll have to remember that one. I haven't done the audiobook yet. I read it twice kind of like two and a half because there are times where I've just like paged back through it especially since this last time when I read it in June I or in January I uh I tabbed so Mm. every certain characters got colors other things were like plot points that I want that I liked or wanted to remember some were just flat out quotes and so I tabbed the crap out of that I went through I think four packages of tabs oh my god I Um, believe it it's a long book it's a long book and there's so many good lines like there's just so much stuff I forgot But I think for me, why I I really didn't know much about it outside of Pennywise. And I think a lot of people don't. And that's so disappointing to me because Pennywise is such a tiny, like the scary clown, while visually a big part in the movies, is such a tiny part of the story. Yeah, that really surprised me. So I think I I had read a couple Stephen King books at that point. um, And I had a bunch of electronic copies. And so one day I was just like, you know what? I'm going to read it. Like, I need to know what this is about. Like, I didn't know about The Losers. Like, I had never seen the miniseries. I knew nothing outside of Tim Curry's Pennywise. 
and I picked it up. I started reading it, and it was it was everything that I love. Like one, it's super quotable. But um, growing up, like The Goonies was my favorite movie. It mm. probably still is. Like easily, it's top two. Yeah. Um, and so, you know that that idea of like these kids banding together and going on adventures and and fighting things and and trying to figure out what the right thing is and how to do it and and standing up for each other. Just, I loved it. I loved it so much. Like I remember calling my mom and being like, Oh my God, I just read it. And it's amazing. And she's like, Oh yeah, I always thought you'd like it. And I'm like, why did you never tell me this? Cause my mom is not (laughs) a horror reader. Like I think she kind of read it probably around when it came out. And I remember we talked about kind of, you know, the weird ending in the tunnel. Um, and she's like, that's unnecessary. I'm like, you know what? I'm not gonna argue with you about that one, but you know, it again is just this book that like, I'm like, Oh, like this is like a a little piece of my heart in a book. Yeah. You know, just friendships and like growing apart, but keeping promises. It's like, how can you, how can you not? And I remember it was when I first got a Fitbit and I remember walking back and forth in my part, in my apartment, reading it (laughs) to get my my steps in. (laughs) (laughs) So vivid in my mind. The first time I was reading it, luckily I had an electronic copy. I wasn't carrying on the fat book that I have now. Um, because I was actually I was switching between my um, reading it on my iPad and reading it, reading the actual hard copy, um, you know, but I remember I'd walk around and I'd read it and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And it was winter and chilly and I'm like, this is terrifying right now. It was a really <laughs> cold February. I will always remember that. But yeah, so and reading it got my got me up to 10,000 steps a day. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I might have to try doing that, reading and walking at the same time, which sounds kind of hard. You get used to it. Our peripheral vision is much better than we think it is. Yeah, that's true. Um, I I just really liked how, while the losers themselves were very specific types of characters with their own um, idiosyncrasies and whatnot, you felt like you could be any one of them. Yes. Um, You could associate with them all so well. I mean, you were drawn to just one particular one, like, oh, that's me. But at the same time, you're like, oh, I could also be a little bit of Eddie. I could also be a little bit of Bev, you know, or, um, or Bill. Just, it was so easy to put yourself in any one of their shoes and, and just feel for them. Yeah. The second time around, I definitely realized I'm a little bit of a Richie. Um, (laughs) I, I realized I, I, when I initially made colors, so I made, when I picked tabs, I did Bill, Ben, Bev, and Mike because I really loved Mike the first time around. And then the second mm-hmm. time reading, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm such a Richie. Like, I marked so many because I had sort of a, an other character tab. And there's so many one of those that are just Richie, Richie remarks or actions where I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> I think upon my second reread, I realized I'm probably a huge Ben, I think. <laughs> um, I do remember when I was in high school... Uh, when I actually had to move um, schools and states, I went from, I moved from California where I had grown up my whole life, um, moving my junior year of high school to a school in Washington where I knew absolutely Rough. nobody. So what I did was just retreated to the library. And while I didn't read anything, um, that was just kind of my safe place because it's tough being a loner in high school, especially when you don't know anybody and being mm-hmm. shy, not wanting to talk to anybody. And you know what? High school kids can be complete assholes. So yeah. it's, it's hard to try to make a friend by asking and not just it naturally happening. Yeah, that's totally true. Cause especially yeah. cause like you get to junior year and everybody's sort of established and. Oh yeah. Yeah. I started, I finished, I only had like a couple months left in my junior year and then, um, senior year started and new absolutely nobody i think i made one or two friends but like we didn't keep in touch or anything like that so just they were a nice little buffer to get me through the year yeah for sure but that is i mean i think the friendships are the central story to it like i remember when i finished i was like why do people call this a scary story like why are people so afraid of this book why do they think this is a horror story because i still don't think it is like i think that was when i first really realized like stephen king defies genre like oh, yeah. he has the reputation for horror because he definitely, you know, goes, you know, supernatural and, and funky and, and that kind of stuff. But I shows he's so much more than that. And that's why I got like super that was when I really drank drank the flavor aid. If you listen to the last <laughs> podcast on left, that's why I really drank the flavor aid on Stephen King. So I was like, This is so this is a masterpiece. Like I was so and I got so defensive about it too. I was like, No, like Stephen King He's not just a horror writer. He's not just you know, 'cause I'd I'd heard other criticism about Stephen King before and I was like, No. 
all of that is ridiculous. That is inaccurate. He's amazing. And so that was definitely the book where I was like, I'd enjoyed the other things I read. Cause at that point I read a bunch of random short stories. I'd read from a Buick eight, which a lot of people trash, but I will say definitely got me to give Stephen King some more chances. And I'd read Salem's lot. Mm, and I yeah. love, and I loved Salem's lot, but it was still like to me that that is kind of just a horror story, I think in some ways. Um, mm-hmm. And then it was like, I read it and I was like, <gasps> this is amazing. Like I was a hundred percent sucked in, started collecting Stephen King books, started reading more of them. Like he got me, he got me. And it was how he got me. I've always described people who, who have never like read it and have only seen either the movie or miniseries. I asked them, have you seen stand by me? And of course, 99% of them all say, yeah. And I said, okay, think of stand by me. If it had a tinge of horror in it, it's not entirely it's not entirely horror. It's just, it's, I mean, if you want to call it like a drama, yes, it's a drama, but it's again, it's just, it's life. There's, there was funny parts. There was sad parts. There was romantic parts, but then there was also that horror element that just gave it a, just enough supernatural tinge to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's just what made it makes it so damn good. I know it's because it's such a combination of things. Like you can't, I I don't understand how, Anybody who reads it can be like, oh, that's just a horror novel. Yeah, no, then I feel like you've never read it then. Well, I mean, I guess it's about perception, but it's, yeah, it's definitely more than that. Yeah. There's uh, someone I'm friends with who is not in the reading world who, uh, anytime I make a post about it, will post like Pennywise or something like that and has never read the book. And I'm like, why? You're just making me not like you. (laughs) You're making me regret my friendship with you every time you're like... Oh, some it posts, especially when because earlier this year I was posting all like those really like deep, intense quotes from the book, and he was just posting Pennywise gifts, and I'm like, oh, mm, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. Well, it's your turn on. again. So your book uh, four. <laughs> okay. So my book four is, um. So this is a case, another case of I saw the trailer for the movie, and was like, oh, this looks really interesting, and then found out it was a book, and I'd already started getting back into reading a little bit. I'd probably read maybe a handful of books at that time and um, knew it was sci-fi, but also seemed very real. Um, So I decided to buy it. And that was uh, the Martian by Andy Weir. Ooh, I do need to read that. (laughs) It's, it's, I mean, they did it justice in the movie. It is almost, almost verbatim. Yeah. They, they, you know, took some liberties here and there, but, the book is obviously better just because there's the more details. And the funny thing is, is I am terrible at math. I'm more of an English person. So there was a lot of math equations and whatnot that he gets really deep into. But at the same time, he wrote it to where you could understand it and not feel dumb, you know? And so what do you was, think someone would learn about you if they read the Martian? Like, that's just, it's, I think that's really what set, I mean, set me off for my love of like sci-fi i get that i had you know grown up loving star wars and things like that but i guess really it's just the it's the resourcefulness of your own mind like yeah your own mind can be um can be your enemy sometimes but it also can be your greatest friend and um i've posted on instagram before i took a break that's kind of what I went through a little bit. You, you know, you do a lot of self doubting and, and whatnot, but you know, you come back around and realize, you know what, you, you were here for a reason. You have the smarts to get yourself out of this place. And while I get, I wasn't stranded on Mars by myself, um, (laughs) you know, just, it it really helps to know that you can help yourself in more ways than one. And just, that's why I think Mark Watney is probably one of my all time favorite characters ever. And, Matt Damon played him to to perfection and just, yeah, just, just everything about that is, is so good. And you do really need to read it. Yeah, I will. I will. Especially because my favorite thing from the movie was the explanation about how he was a space pirate. Yes. That technically under the laws that govern what they're doing, he was a pirate. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That is amazing. (laughs) There's so many little things like that sprinkled throughout the book. It's, it's so good. 
Yes, my favorite pin. Uh, uh, my favorite subscription is Nerdy Post. Everybody knows this if you follow me on Instagram. Mm. Uh, and they did. She did a sci-fi box, and one of the things is a little pin that says "Space Pirate," oh. <laughs> inspired by The Martian. It's my favorite. Oh, man, I would love to have that too. That's cool. I'll see if she has more. I'll send you one. Ah, yes. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to yours. Okay, so. I read nonfiction. I really like memoir. So my next one is called Let's Pretend This Never Happened by Jenny Lawson. Mm. Uh, it's her first It's her first book. Her second one is one most people know because it has a fun taxidermied raccoon on the front. It's called Furiously Happy. I but, have that one. Um, and that one is more about, I think, more specifically about mental illness, I think, overall. But Let's Pretend This Never Happened is sort of about her growing up. It is the funniest book I've ever read in my life. Like, I think anybody who reads that, I'm like, this is, you will understand my sense of humor and <laughs> so much if you read that book. Because <laughs> the first time I was reading it, um, I had started following her on Twitter for some reason. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get her book. And so I got the first one and I'm on like the second or third chapter called Stanley the Magical Squirrel. And Magical Talking Squirrel, excuse me. And I was... <sighs> My husband thinks it's really weird that I actually laugh out loud to things that I'm like reading. And so I'm trying really hard to hold in an extreme amount of laughter. And he comes out <laughs> into, our, into our front porch and is like, are you, are you okay? Are you, are you choking? <laughs> and I was like, you have to read this. And so I read him the chapter and he also laughed and he's like, okay, I understand this one. Like, this is, this is pretty funny yeah. because she's just, she managed to take all these sort of dark and sad things and still make them funny or, you know, she grew up very poor and still makes it hilarious. Like, it's just a person who can always find, like, the absurd or just the humorous in any situation. And I think that's just something I really appreciated and something I really needed at the time that I was reading that book. And so, also, the audiobook is hilarious because she narrates it herself. Um, mm. She sings all of the chapter titles. So, sometimes they get stuck <laughs> in my head like a song and I end up singing them to myself. Um <laughs> But I, I probably listen to the audiobook of that at least once a month. Like, if I don't oh, know what man. to put on and I just need music in the back, I just need something in the background, but I don't want music because it will distract me, I just put on that book because I can hop in and out of it and I know what's going on. Um, but it just, it's hilarious. Like, anybody who watches it is like, oh, this is, this is how, this is my approach to humor. That is absolutely that book. It is so funny. You might have, you might be getting me into nonfiction because I've read next to none i think the only one i've read in the past few years was born a crime by trevor noah yeah um i listened to the audiobook which i feel like books like that it's almost better to just listen to the audiobook and not read it because again it's the author's get... actual voice reading exactly. their words yeah yeah exactly and that was amazing um and speaking of audible i have so many audible credits i'm definitely gonna get that <laughs> one with one of them because i have um i have furiously happy um and read what it was about, and I was like, okay, this sounds interesting, but I may not get to it right away. But knowing that you said that this was her first one and is more about her growing up, now I really want to read it. Yeah, and I think Furiously Happy is really good, and the concept of Furiously Happy is really amazing. Like, she's she's been through a lot, um, and it definitely helps with perspective, which is something she also talks about a lot. Um, but just the first book, just, I don't know, like hit me and just right where I'm like, this is, this is great. Like I would probably say it's one of my all time favorite books. It's, it's the other one that made the list. It just makes me, it gives me perspective. It reminds me that like other people are going through other things that are different than I am. And that sometimes I might be blowing something out of proportion. Yeah. <laughs> and I think we all need that reality check once in a while. Definitely. All right. Uh, man, are we on the final book already? We are on the final book. Oh, shit. Okay. Um, also, if you're going to have an honorable mention, then I get to have an honorable mention. Okay. <laughs> All right. That sounds fine. Um, also, my fifth book is really embarrassing, so that's why I need to redeem myself a little bit with an honorable oh, mention. God. Mine is, my last one goes to a, uh, <laughs> I guess, extremely personal place. Um, so I'll just start off by saying it is The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Ooh. Um, and anyone who's read that knows it just destroys you emotionally, mentally, just every which way. Yeah. Um, and it's for me, it's yes, it's a sad book to read, but also it makes me happy in the sense that so I grew up fatherless, even though he lived in the same city my entire life. Um, 
So reading this book about a father and a son, uh, you know, at the edge of the world during the apocalypse, um, and that the father in the book doesn't only cares about himself to be there to care for the kid. The only thing he cares about now is the kid, his whole well being, his survival, just everything. Um, you know, he could totally do without himself being there, but he has to be there to take care of him. And that just from a personal place told me that, oh, there are good fathers out there, even um, in the apocalypse. That's all they want to do is be a good dad. And I've been told that I would make a good dad someday. And just reading that really made me realize that, yeah, you, you know, even in the apocalypse, you can still be a good dad and selfless and that there are good people out there. So, yeah, that is, that's heavy to share. Thank you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think we all have, have books that, that do that. Actually, it's weird that you say that because as embarrassing as my next book is, that's also kind of why a, a similar thing for me. <laughs> so, well, um, do you know who Nora Roberts is? Uh, yes. Yeah. The romance author. Okay. She gets trashed for being direct mass market, but if we ever talk about books that scare our pants off, one of hers genuinely terrified me. Oh, um, wow. But it's her, she has a, tr- uh, a trilogy called Lovers and Dreamers. And I think it was the first of her books I ever read. My mom had read them for ages, but it was the first ones I ever read. And it um, it, re- it was about like found family. Uh, so I'm an only child. My, uh, my dad and my mom both have really big families, but we've always kind of lived away from everybody. And so for me, it was like, I get to choose who my siblings are. I get to choose the people in my life who, who make my family bigger. And that book is a lot about that, about, you know, none of these people are necessarily related to each other, but they're just really, really good friends and they see each other as family and they, they act as if they're family. And I think that was just really impactful on me, um, there's also a ghost and a treasure hunt and all this other crazy stuff that oh, is wow. the reasons I love her books. Cause there's always, especially anytime she includes a ghost, like I'm there, she writes very good ghost stories from both a scary and a like tragedy kind of sense. Mm. Um, like really if Nora Roberts would ever sit down and be like, I'm going to write an actual legit horror novel. It would be a really good horror novel. I have absolutely no doubt. Um, but that trilogy in particular, I read, um this is, oh this is a great story i should totally share this one so my freshman year of college um some of the girls in our dorm like the wing of my dorm decided to decorate our bathroom super inappropriately like they bought playgirl and so there were just penises oh God. everywhere in our bathroom <laughs> but then also like inside the stalls they had pulled out like the book excerpts that come in cosmo oh god so there's an excerpt from the second book in this trilogy in one of our bathroom stalls. And I kept being like, I got, I got to find this book. Like I got to read this. This is intriguing. And I ended up (laughs) buying um, like the little omnibus of all three. And I loved it. I loved it. That's how I found it. That's how I started reading Nora Roberts. Despite my mom having the books on our shelves for years. I was like, this is what I saw this in a bathroom surrounded by penises. I'm going to read this book. (laughs) Um, And that's how I picked it up. And I read it like the, the first, first summer between, uh, between my first and second year of college when my parents were moving away from my childhood home I was being separated from all my like friends for my whole life and like it was after that that I never really got to come home again after that summer and I think that that also shaped it but in terms of like my loyalty to people and my feelings about people that like once I say you're family like I will put up with a lot from you because that's what family does yes uh, and that book is definitely definitely that for me well see that wasn't that's not embarrassing if you would you know said something like one of her like i don't i can't remember does she do like schlocky love stories too oh she she does like her one she did like this huge bride run recently that i was not into at all but like mid early early to mid 2000s she wrote a bunch of like ghosty love stories like there's ghosts in a lot of them and those are all really good Mm -hmm. Um, i might i might also be thinking of what is it janet ivanovich that does like the one for the money and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, she's definitely uh, like, you know, she started her career doing Harlequin romance, bodice yeah. rivers and, you know, erotica and whatnot, but she definitely, because she came, so became so popular. Like she's direct to mass market for the most part now, but that's because she's so popular. Like every book she writes is going to be a bestseller because people just, you know, it's those books that you can just pick up and grab and read. Yeah. Uh, I often refer to her as a coffee bean book. 
Mm. Because at uh, at perfume counters, they'll have you smell coffee beans in between scents because it cleanses like the palate of your nose. Oh, okay. And that's sometimes when I'm like really stuck and I can't figure out what to read or I am like really still like hung over by a book. I'll just grab one of her books and read it. And I enjoy the story. I enjoy the characters. I've revisited a lot of her books. Like there's probably four or five trilogies that I've read more than once just because they – the story is good. I am energized by the story and it clears my mind to read the next thing. That's a really good description of the, the whole coffee bean book. Cause I feel like we all have something like that. A lot of people, Terry Potter. <laughs> yeah, I can see like, I'm just gonna read Harry Potter again and see how, where this goes. And don't get me wrong. I, I do that too, but I often like fall into like a Harry Potter, like funk where I'm like, okay, if I'm going to read one book. I have to read all seven. And then if I'm going to read the books, I have to watch the movies. Like <laughs> it gets crazy. I've I've started doing that with short stories because I'm a very huge mood reader. Unless there's a book I'm very excited to get to, once I finish a book, I have absolutely no idea what to read next. So, pick up a short story from Stephen King or Joe Hill or Ray Bradbury, and just be like, you know what, this story is making me want to read something like this. Oh, I happen to have something like this, so let's read that book. You know? Yeah, I was I would consider still consider myself mostly a mood reader, but since having a kid who takes up all of your time. I've tried to stick more to a TBR because then I actually, then I don't waste time not reading something. I'll be like, okay, this is what I was going to try, try to read next. Let's give it a go. So I'm like halfway through dandelion wine right now. So it's like, okay, that's what I was going to read this month. And I like it. I mean, I'm definitely going to, I know I really enjoy it and it's beautifully written, but at the same time, like this isn't what I want to be reading, but I don't know what I want to be reading. So I'm going to keep reading this. See, that's why I kind of had to stay away from TBRs because then I would either read two pages a day because it kind of felt like homework or um, I would just abandon it after 50 pages. And then that's which probably took six days to read when I could have been using that six days to read something else, you know? So now it's just like, you know what, take after you finish a book, take a day, kind of pick up one or two, read the first chapter and whatever grabs you grabs you. For sure. All right. Your honorable mention. All right. Well, my honorable mention I'm um, just going to come right out and say it is it's my favorite book, like I mentioned earlier, and it's Nosferatu by Joe Hill, um, which by that point I had already been reading. Um, I had already been heavily into reading uh, and found out that, you know, he was Stephen King's son and read what Nosferatu was about. And I was like, oh, this sounds pretty interesting. So bought it and it just sat on my shelf for about a year <laughs> and uh, just something one day just made me want to read it and kind of a mistake that being my first Joe Hill book. Cause not that his other books aren't great, just comparatively just pale in comparison. Um, but I remember reading it in, man, I remember reading it in like May or June or something like that. And then, um, just really loved it. Just, I've, I flew through it in like three weeks, which for me at the time was pretty fast and then Christmas time rolled around and I was like, you know what? I'm going to read that again. So less than <laughs> less than six months later, read it again. And I think that time I finished it in a week, which close to 700 pages, me doing that in a week. That's all I was doing in my spare time was reading that, which I know some people can somehow read a 700 page book in like two days, which boggles my mind. But but yeah, that's it's just it's so scary, but it's it's, it's almost like it. It's it's scary, but it's fantastical, but it's a human drama and it's got, um, a little bit of romance to just everything. It's just, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I love it so much. And we're only what a week and a half away from the series. And I'm so excited. I know. And the only thing I will say about that, that kind of bugs me is they mentioned at some point that, uh, the first season is only about the first third of the book, which is a little scary. Yeah, how many episodes is it supposed to be? Ten. Oh. Maybe, maybe first, maybe they said first half, but they also said, I remember them saying, oh, if we're lucky enough to get a second season, um, then they're going to expand upon it. And they're like, who knows? Maybe there's more people out in the world that have powers like Vic and Maggie. And I'm like, okay, that does sound cool. And I do like that idea, but I also want to see. Want them to actually follow through the whole story. Yeah, I want to see this whole story wrapped up. And who knows? Um it's been getting fantastic reviews. I haven't heard one bad thing about it from the people who have seen the first like two or three episodes. So let's, let's hope that continues through the whole first season. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. So now your honorable mention. Uh, my honorable mention is Stardust by Neil Gaiman. Oh, I've been wanting to read that. Well, the hard thing, too, is a lot of people have read, you know, American Gods, uh, hopefully Good Omens. I'm really excited for the show starting in a week. Um, <laughs> coming Still haven't read that coming yet. Coming out on Amazon. <laughs> uh, but a lot of people have – Stardust is weird, even for a Neil Gaiman book. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a fairy tale for adults uh, without – but I feel like a lot of times people turn fairy tale for adults, they make it like really sexy or really violent. Like, no, yeah. adults can also go on these sort of life changing adventures and experience magic and wonder and awe in all of these same ways. And uh, I do really enjoy the movie, although the movie is a very bizarre translation of the book. Um, mm-hmm. I love both. Um, I love the book more, but the the movie is very entertaining and it, it makes me feel like I see the world, even if I'm not seeing the story that I know. I will say that. Um, but the book itself just takes me away. You know, I think Dunstan and Evane are just characters I like. I like seeing them together. Um, I like seeing how they deal with the world and and your place in it. But that book just always makes me feel safe. I don't know. I just feel very content when I read it. Um, and I, I just think it's it's an underrated game in to me. Um, because people only really know the movie, and then they read the book, and they're like, "What is this?" Because they're not yeah. they're not alike at all. Uh, the humor that's in the movie is not not really in the book. Mm. Um, but that's how I started reading Neil Gaiman. That was my first Gaiman. Oh man, my my first Gaiman became my favorite Gaiman, and that was Neverwhere. I still haven't read that one. I was supposed to, that was on the TBR for this month. That did not. That's not going to happen. I but... saw that, and I was going to try to urge you to do it, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, I read that, and then somehow um, I ended up, before the movie came out, I was like, oh, this is an author who writes a bunch of, who's written a bunch, a bunch of stuff. At that point, it was probably shortly after American Gods came out, actually, that I started really reading him, but that's when I got um, Coraline. Mm. I got the Graveyard book, like, the day it came out, um, when that was being released. Like, I just started really following him, and... I'm really, it's, he's on my list. I started keeping a list of like things I want to read to Veronica when she gets old enough. And like Coraline yeah, is right up there. <laughs> definitely. Coraline and the graveyard book are definitely going to be things she reads. And he's got like, uh, some more like younger kid, middle grade books, uh, that I'll get and, and we'll read them. I think other than his, yeah, the younger, the very young audience books and his short story collections, I think Stardust and American Gods are the only one, only books I haven't read by him. Um, well, if you haven't read American Gods, you haven't read Anansi Boys either. No, I haven't. Which I'm staring at my bookshelf. I have three copies of each of those books. I have three copies of American Gods, and I have three copies of Anansi Boys, and I have never read either of them. Oh, man. Uh, American Gods is really good. It's it's <sighs> definitely is, very dense. Yeah, well, being a mood reader, like I have to be ready for a story like that. And I keep getting yeah. like where I'm starting to feel it, where I'm like, oh, that's the book that's like growing in the back of my head. And then the time is just never right. Yeah. It's hard um, to explain to people being a mood reader. Like, yeah, like if you want to read it, just read it. And it's like, no, it's not no, that easy. No, that's not how that works. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've tried American Gods a couple times and I get further every time. It just never, I just don't think I get far enough to be totally pulled in. And at first I thought, oh, maybe I don't like reading adult Neil Gaiman books. And then I tried to read Good Omens and I was like, oh, that's not it. <laughs> because Good yeah. Omens is fantastic. I still need to read that depending on how fast I read. Um, I'm reading a very short book right now and I have another one coming in the mail that I don't know how long it is, but I'm seeing it all over bookstagram. Um, I'll probably read that next. And depending on how much time I have left, um, I might read that. I'm not sure. Good old mood reader. What'd you get? Uh, you can't say that and then not tell us what the book is. I know it was, it's, um, what is it? The thicket by Joe Lansdale. I've, uh, I talked to somebody about it a couple weeks ago, told me they absolutely loved it. It was kind of like, um, I think I I don't think they told me this, but I think I remember reading it, it being described as like if Cormac McCarthy wrote Stand By Me. Interesting. Yeah. So that already was like, okay. And I know it has to do with a bounty hunting dwarf and they got, um, they cast uh, Peter Dinklage in that role for the movie. So that really hyped me up for it. Yeah. Sounds really good. Um, That does sound good. But, yeah, you definitely need to read Neverwhere. I, the, the Neverwhere and The Ocean at the End of the Lane, I remember the whole time reading them, even though there's, like, dark, scary parts, just 
smiling the whole time because that's his writing. He's so, I've always described him as enchanting and that's exactly how his writing is. Yes, he is always whimsical even when he's like talking to you about somebody being murdered. Yes. And and it's so awesome that he narrates all his own books because he's got a great voice. I love that. Yes, he does. Especially like anytime he has to do an old lady entertains me greatly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Have you read Ocean at the End of the Lane? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, that another one that's less than 200 pages but is not a page longer than it needs to be and is just perfect yes he's very you know you think from a book like american gods it's so huge and so dense that he'd be one of those like word vomiters a bit like our favorite king Mm -hmm. but he's not like he's i think he's very economical and i think he really chose chooses his words well yeah he definitely doesn't waste them it's it's a case of if it's there it needs to be there there's no fluff it's all killer no filler yes definitely all right is that it did we finish in less than an hour i thought we were going to spend way more time doing this i i think people spend less time than they think they will like you want to let the book speak for itself of like if you read this you will understand something about me yeah or maybe you might understand more about me than i do about myself if that's the book that i pick (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) Well, damn it, this was fun, and you that was a very good um, discussion that you came to me with. Because so. I feel um, like we're used, to, as readers, we are used to people asking us, well, what are your favorite books? It's not the same thing as, like, what book would tell me something about you? Yeah. Um, is this something you've been, that's been kind of gestating for you, or just oh, decided yeah, to throw time. it out there? Okay. All the time. Because I, I think I look back at, like, what books were favorites. And honestly, you know, it, and let's pretend this never happened, definitely on my, on, like, my top five. But, like, the other three are not even mentioned. Like, it's, because it's different. It's, it's, there's a difference between a story I like to read and disappear into versus something I feel, like, changed me or I learned from it. hmm I always struggle with whether or not Dune is one of my all-time favorite books. I will, I will own that. Because it's so complicated. I don't, I, uh, I, I don't think it's easy to tell people like what's your favorite books like we we memorize the list but like if we had to be like bet your life on it are those the same books we would pick yeah that's that's pretty i mean i feel like i would cheat and if if someone told me like oh this is the only thing you can read forever then i would say the dark tower series because that's eight books <laughs> so like i would kind of cheat on that one but you know, people always tell me, like, what's your favorite book? And I always say, oh, well, my favorite non-Stephen King book and non-Dark Tower book is Nosferatu. Nosferatu. And, then, yeah. and then be like, okay, what's your favorite Stephen King book? And then I'm like, well, my favorite non-Dark Tower Stephen King book would be It. it yeah. You know, just there's, it's like Inception. You have to go down all the all the layers. Yes. And I was uh, just like, well, I'd probably still pick Harry Potter. If I could only read, like, one series forever, I'd probably still go with Harry Potter see i'm still i need to i'm on order of the phoenix i haven't i started it but i didn't get very far because mood reader yeah oh i harry potter for me was the first time that there was an i had an experience with other people reading the same thing i was reading Mm. Uh, because i got into it early on but then when the fourth book came out enough people had also been reading harry potter and that was when the releases started to turn into events And when, like, I had to get done before everybody else. And so I think the last four, five, six, and seven, I can tell you exactly what was going on in my life when those books came out. (laughs) And what what I did the first time I read them and what they were like. And, like, those were all things where that was the first time that reading the book, the context of the experience I was having while reading it was really important. Um, You know, now I love that I can look at my bookshelves and I can be like, oh, when I read this book, these things were happening. And when I read this book, these things were happening. Like, it made me pay more attention to the context under which I'm reading something for the first time. Especially if I think it's something I'm going to really love. Yeah, exactly. Like, Uh, I remember nothing about the first time I read Stardust other than what my copy looked like, who I got it from. I don't even remember how I felt about it. (laughs) So I I read that. That was enjoyable. And then (laughs) remembering, oh, like, Neil Gaiman, I should should look that guy up. Yeah. You know, I was like probably 16. <laughs> yeah. And I, I kind of wish I had that with the Dark Tower series because when I started them, obviously they had all been released and I just devoured them all in less than a year. And it would have been nice to kind of make an event out of it and read them as they came out. But if I 
had to wait that four year gap of the cliffhanger between books three and four, I would have lost my mind. <laughs> yeah, that's totally understandable. A four year gap for a cliffhanger is just way too damn long. Two years, okay, you're you're getting people very, very, very excited. Four years is just torture. Yeah. And I, I don't think I even there. I think I read the first two back to back, read a couple of the things, f- flew through the third one, and was like, oh well, there's no way I'm going to read another book in between. I'm immediately starting the next one right now. Yeah, I flew through the Gunslinger and then had no interest in picking up the next book, and then I did the Gunslinger again, and then I read the Drawing of the Three, and I was like, oh, like, I like this. I was like, oh, I'll just move on to the Wastelands anyway, and then I loved the Wastelands. I think that one's still my favorite so far. See, that was my favorite the first go around, and then the second second go around, I was like, you know what? Drawing of the Three is freaking amazing. Uh, I don't know. Something about that book frustrates me. You know what? Uh, it, when I read it for the f- third, fourth time, I can't remember. I still really do love it, but then I did notice a couple of little things that were like, yeah, starting to irritate me and, and kind of bug me. And then I read in the Wastelands again. I was like, damn it, maybe this one is actually my favorite one because every time I come back to the third one, I'm always so enthralled with it all over again. Yeah, well, what, when I'm done with all with all of them, well, you and I will revisit this because um, I don't want to say why I like the Wastelands more than the Drawing of the Three because that will open up a whole other door that we do not have time for. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll we'll put a pin in that one and, and see. <laughs> open up a door. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> Well, this may have to be a uh, regular or semi-regular thing. I don't know. I I think it should be. It's so much easier to have someone else to bounce off of. Yes. And we read so many similar things or have a similar approach, I think, to books. Like, you know, we can't... I don't think it would be easy for you to be like, hey, we're going to read this book and talk about it. Like, I I doubt that. But I think we have a similar approach to how how we do things and interpreting them and... Yeah, it'd be fun to talk about it some more. Yes, we'll have to. Well, like I said, regardless, we'll have to see what the reception is. But again, I don't care. It's fun. (laughs) I love doing it. I'm going to do it anyway. So. And then we have a reason to talk to each other every week. Yes. Other than, I mean, it's not like we don't talk to each other about books in general anyway, but. Like, like every day. But it's not the same. No. We can do this every week. No, yeah. I'm I'm totally fine with it as, as long as you and. I was going to say other people, but again, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> we want to do this. We're going to do it. Yeah, I was like, I care that other people want to listen to it. If they don't want to hear it, then I don't care. <laughs> yeah, don't be rude. Be kind. Exactly. Well, I guess right. until next time, we'll have to, I guess I'll try to have to come up with a damn good episode because as soon as you had told me that idea, I was like, God damn it, that is really good. I know. And it was hard, but I think we... I'm glad we didn't do this yesterday because I probably would have scrambled and not picked the same books. Well, when I originally told you, I was like, well, I have three. One of those books didn't even make this list. Oh, shit. I had totally <laughs> changed my mind. So, <laughs> yeah, because I did. I sat down in front of the bookshelf somewhere. I was like, mm, I don't think I can. That one's not right anymore. I had to, like, dig around and look at stuff. And not even all my books are out right now. So, so oh. it's, it's, it's a hard thing to think about because it's a different question. Like, we're all so geared to... What's your favorite book? This is not that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I and see now. Like tomorrow, you're gonna be like, "Oh, I should have said this book." Go oh, I think I'm, all, I'm already. I've already <laughs> been thinking that. So, uh, yeah, I, I I knew I had a, a top three that I was gonna stick with, and I was like, "Damn, I don't know what the other two are." And then I was like, "Oh, okay, this one's a good one. This is a good one." Uh, but damn it, I wanted this one to be on there, and I was like, "Okay, one of them has to be an honorable mention," and that's when I threw Nosferatu to you off and made, just made it the honorable mention. I think that's fair. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming up with this because it was so much fun, even though a little piece of it felt like homework because I struggled with it. But in the end, it was still fun. It made you think and it made you look at your books in a new way. So I'm glad that was helpful. Yeah, that kind of opened up. I, when I saw The Road, I was like, oh, that's a really good one. And then I was like, but why? And then they just went off on a tangent in my own head. And I was like, damn it. Yeah, that has to go on there. <laughs> For and sure. A, and I also had to save it for the last. <laughs> well, I appreciate you sharing that, though. Like, books are deeply personal, and they they tell us something about ourselves. And it's it's good every once in a while that we stop and reflect on that. Yes. Yeah, that was, even though it was kind of a dour subject, it was still a relief. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I'll get to thinking on another subject, and we'll have to do this again. Absolutely.
All right. Thank you for doing this and thank you for coming up with the idea. I'm sure I'm sure I'll message you in a few minutes. <laughs> Probably. I'm not going to doubt it. <laughs> okay. Bye, B. All right. Take care.